I'm uh, Lorna Condon. I'm a member of the board of the Ephemera Society of America. <laughs> okay, I'll start. I'm, I'm Lorna Condon. I'm a member of the board of the Ephemera Society of America and the senior curator of the Library and Archives at Historic New England in Boston. And today it is my great pleasure to introduce Kevin Johnson to you. Kevin uh, earned his professional certificate in photography from the main photographic workshops where he first encountered the Eastern Illustrating and Publishing Company, the largest manufacturer of real photo postcards in the United States. The Penobscot Marine Museum acquired uh, this collection in, in Searsport, acquired this collection in 2007. Kevin, uh, serving as the museum's photo archivist, Kevin has grown the museum's collection to more than 500,000 images, including uh, images from the EIP collection, among many other sources. Kevin is the co-author with my uh, good friends Earl Shuttleworth and Bill Bunting of Maine on Glass, the early 20th century in glass plate photography, which is, Kevin tells me, about to be reprinted. And if you're interested in seeing a copy of it, look outside. He has left a copy for us to look at. In addition, Kevin uh, founded, is a founded and co-owner of the Our House Gallery in Belfast, Maine. So today we will hear from Kevin about the Eastern Illustrating and Publishing Company of Belfast, Maine. Kevin. Good afternoon, everyone, and happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, it's almost beer 30, so hang in there. I'm Kevin Johnson. I'm the photo archivist of the Penobscot Marine Museum located in Searsport, Maine. Um, the Penobscot Marine Museum is the oldest maritime museum in the state and founded in 1936. Um, today I'm going to tell you the story about the Eastern Illustrating and Publishing Company and the uh, vast collection of glass negatives that they left behind. So in 1909, Rudolf Herman Cassens started a real photo postcard company in Belfast, Maine. Belfast is the next town down from Searsport, both of which are in the Midcoast, Maine. He saw an opportunity in the emerging postcard market that would allow him to compete with the big postcard companies. Providing local views of the small towns and villages in New England was an untapped market. Making real photo postcards allowed smaller print runs which better fit the needs of general store owners. In their peak years, which were the teens and the 20s, Eastern was producing more than a million postcards a year. Pictured here, we see um, Herman Casson himself standing in front of his vehicle. And on the far left is his brother, Fred, who did the Vermont and New Hampshire views. And in the center is Horace Ellingwood of Winterport, Maine, who is known for his coastal views. If you look at the sign on the side of his vehicle, you can tell that Cassens had big plans for his startup company. He wasn't just going to photograph Maine or even just New England. He was going to photograph the entire continental United States. <laughs> and though he didn't pull that off, he thoroughly photographed all of New England and upstate New York and even a handful of towns down to Florida, where there also is a large number of eastern negatives and left behind essentially a photographic survey of New England in the first three decades of the 20th century. I always like to include this view um, when I do my talks about Eastern because it really sets the stage um, for the true popularity of postcards. What we're looking at is the Eastern glass plate negative of Miss R. L. Jackson's postcard shop in St. Stephen, New Brunswick. This image illustrates the popularity of postcards in the first decades of the 20th century. Postcards were an early form of social media, comparable today to Instagram or Twitter. In 1913 alone, 968 million postcards were sent in the United States, an average of more than seven per US citizen. 
On one day in September of 1906, 200,000 postcards were mailed from Coney Island, New York. What's remarkable about those statistics is half of the postcards that were purchased were never mailed, but rather collected and traded. Postcard albums were very popular during this time. And even today in the United States, um, I should say in the world, postcards are the third most collected um, object. Um, they're not third in the United States as um, sports trading cards has that spot. Um, but it gives you a sense of how popular they still are. And if you notice in looking at this photograph, um, not only get you, can you pick from the hundreds of postcards um, in Miss Jackson's shop, you can even sit down on the table in the back and write them out. There's a handy inkwell there while you warm yourself by that beautiful stove and then even drop them in the mailbox um, in the uh, far left corner on your way out of the store. Postcard popularity um, even made its way into the Maine legislature in 1916 when the governor proclaimed that April 19th to be postcard day. In this proclamation, he stated, and I quote, I, Oakley Curtis, as governor of this state, do hereby designate and set apart April 19th as postcard day, and I do respectfully request and urge that on that day that all residents of Maine send picture postcard greetings to their friends and acquaintances outside of the state bearing appropriate messages such as, come to Maine, <laughs> auto to Maine this summer, and Spend your vacation and holidays in Maine, thereby enlisting the advertised Maine movement, which is most worthy in its purpose of making Maine known to the world. A little backstory about this proclamation. There had been an earlier article in Down East Magazine that talked about the proclamation um, making Maine Postcard Day, but they had the year as 1915. And at the museum, we were hoping to have a big exhibit to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Maine Postcard Day. And I was putting the Maine um, State Archivist to work to try to dig up a copy of this proclamation. And he spent weeks looking for it and couldn't find it, um, which was kind of putting a, a dent in my plans. But fortunately, like many archivists, he did not give up. And he decided to look into the next year and in 1916, he found the actual proclamation. So it was a typo in the original article, but he ended up tracking it down for me. Eastern played up the real photo um, aspect of their cards, referring to them as genuine photographs. Advertising postcards such as these indicate they offered much more than scenic views. Enlargements, novelty cards, map postcards, as well as even display racks. Here we're looking um, on Bridge Street in Belfast, and we see uh, Mr. Cassens on the right. He um, took some of the early views, um, but became much more involved in the management of the company. Um, behind the wheel of the company Maxwell, is Horace Ellingwood, and as I mentioned earlier, he was known for his coastal views. Casson's father-in-law was a man named Edgar Hansen, and he owned one of Belfast's two local newspapers, the Waldo Herald. Casson started the business in this building in 1909. The postcard company employees are posing in front of it. We believe that uh, his father-in-law also taught him the publishing trade. On the far right, you can see one of the photographer's car with the back open and his case for his camera and glass plates sitting there. The postcard photographers were all men, each outfitted with the modified Model T. They would leave Belfast in the late spring as soon as the roads were hard enough to drive on. And they would fan out to their designated regions of New England and not return until the fall. Their cars would occasionally end up 
in the postcards, like this one. This is East Parsons Field, Maine. These cards are favorites among collectors. And if you didn't know, collectors of postcards are called deltiologists. The photographers used box cameras like the one pictured below and five by seven inch glass plate negatives. We see uh, Horace Ellingwood with his camera on a tripod up at Chimney Pond, which is at the foot of Mount Katahdin. And as the years piled up, Eastern had enough views that each photographer was outfitted with a salesman catalog for his designated region of New England. This is a sample of one of them. The photographers, um, this, I'm sorry, this catalog is one that showed their novelty cards. And every um, photographer salesman had one of these along with the postcard that showed the, the views of their region. The museum was able to acquire more than a dozen of the original salesman catalogs. Unfortunately, though, it was after they first fell into the hands of postcard collectors and dealers who removed all the postcards from them. So we have a dozen lovely albums that are essentially empty other than an index in the front. The photographers both took the, post the photographs and sold the postcards. There was a saying in the company that it was easier to teach a salesman to be a photographer than it was to teach a photographer to be a salesman. They were paid primarily by commission. In the early days, postcards sold two for five cents. So you can imagine how many postcards they had to sell to make a living. But I'd have to think it was a pretty nice job to cruise around New England in the summertime and hitting the places that the tourists like to go. After a couple years in the newspaper building, Eastern moved up the street into this house-like building which sat on High Street in Belfast. It was said that they brought racks of wet postcards across High Street to the Shoot and Shorey garage where they were allowed to use one of the car bays to dry out their cards. This building is no longer there and there's just a kind of triangular green space in town now. Now this is not Eastern Illustrating, but most likely this is what it would have looked like inside of their factory building. The vats of chemicals that you see here would include a developer bath, a stop bath, a fixer bath, probably one of just water to wash the cards, and then a sepia toning bath. The cards were put in each bath in, in batches and stirred with wooden paddles and transferred from one bath to the next. And heaven forbid if you were um, wrongly put the wrong paddle into the wrong bath and contaminated the chemicals. If you look up in the upper right hand corner of this image you can see on the wall a small sign that says don't spit. <laughs> Apparently uh, chewing tobacco um, did not have the best effect on the card's quality. <laughs> this is the type of postcard printing machine that Eastern used. They supposedly had four of them. They would hold a glass plate in registration and the postcard stock would be fed through the side the um, postcard would go underneath the glass plate, which would then be pressed on top of it. It would be exposed to light, and then it would shoot out the side. And then they could automate this so it would do more than 100 cards in a minute. Once the glass plates were developed, they actually were put back into their original glass plate boxes. 
and then stored in these wooden crates. The crates were actually came from Eastman Kodak with the unexposed film when they first purchased it, but then they reused them to store the, the actual plates. On the edge of the boxes, they would write the names of the towns or villages that were photographed so they knew what was inside. And they would use typed indexes taped to the front of the box that said what was inside. Most of the workers at the factory in Belfast were women. They worked 12 hours a day, they got a half an hour for lunch, and they earned $11 a week. It was primarily a family business and it was also seasonal, with most of the work happening in the summer tourist season. The women both took the orders, printed the cards, and trimmed them, and they also titled the cards. The titles were written directly on the emulsion side of the glass plates in black washable ink. They had to be written left to right, which was then reversed in the printing process. Some letters like R and S were especially difficult, as seen here. T's and I's, not so hard. This is a rare exception where you see the photographer's name written onto the glass plate. Most of them were anonymous, with the exception of Cassins himself but I believe M.A. Cook was a freelance photographer that occasionally worked for them, and Easter end up, ended up with his negatives when he passed. One of the telltale signs of the Eastern plate or postcard is the style of the title. Until the 1940s, the titles were handwritten, identifying what the image was, where it was, and a number, or occasionally a number-letter combination. This title reads, Mr. George Young, Vermont's original Uncle Sam, St. Johnsbury, Vermont, number 32. The number at the end is not a date. Many people think that, but it's not. But it is a clue to how you can date the postcards. This was the 32nd plate made by this photographer on that day or outing. The number corresponded to a number written by the photographer on the side of the plate. The number 32, which appears backwards here, was written on the negative prior to the shooting by the photographer. It matched up to a list he made as he photographed a town. And that list was then used by the women at the factory to know what to write for the title. The edge itself would have been cropped out in the printing, in the printing process and so would not be seen in a postcard. Not many postcards were made during World War II, but Eastern um, did make them again later into the 40s and the 50s. But at this time, they stopped using glass plate negatives and switched over to flexible film. They still used five by seven um, inch sheets, um, but instead of handwriting the titles, they used typed um, titles that were typed onto acetate and then scotch taped to the negative. An archivist's nightmare. <laughs> they continued to make the black and white postcards um, into the late 1950s which was probably not the best business decision for them as most other postcard companies were all color at this point. Over the decades, Eastern postcard backs had different styles, often representing different eras of the company. Looking at the bottom right is the oldest version and then if you go counterclockwise, you can see the progression. That said, there were many postcards out there that had no marking on the back. But typically, from the, the way it was titled, you can tell 
if it was or wasn't an Eastern. As I mentioned before, the negatives that they used were five inches by seven inches, yet the postcards they made were three and a half inches by five inches. So every image was cropped. Here we're looking at the full view of Main Street in Belfast, looking up toward the post office and custom house. Notice the young boy um, on the left. He's dressed in a Native American costume. And there's a man in the horse and buggy on the right who's obviously keeping his eye on the photographer. Some great signage from the various businesses that line Main Street. So here we see the crop version of that same image. And uh, what's interesting about that, and it kind of pertains to a conversation we were having last night about collecting and if you have a collection that you know what was in it and you can collect everything, it's finite. But with these postcards, with each printing, the way whoever put the glass plate into one of those machines, if it wasn't registered in the exact same way, you might see more of the top or more of the bottom or more of the left or more to the right. And so there are numerous versions of every postcard out there. They use black washable ink, which was easily removed with rubbing alcohol, so that if the, a general store like the Smith store sold to the Joneses with a little rubbing alcohol, they could wipe out Smith and write in Jones and then not have to make a new photograph. They were very industrial that way. But many of their views also um, showed up on the lithograph type cards. So it seems that their images were occasionally either licensed or pirated by the bigger postcard companies. Copyright seemed to be loosely followed during this period of time. The back of this card has no attribution to Eastern at all. In the 1960s, the company changed hands um, and switched to making color chrome postcards, sort of like this one. And they made those for another 20 years and actually became successful again after many years of being unsuccessful. And this was one of their more famous color cards, um, which shows the directional signs to all the different towns in Maine named after different countries. The collection also contains some of Herman Casson's personal photography. This portrait of him was made by M.A. Cook, whose name we saw earlier on the uh, postcard of the Searsport Library. He was, Casson's was the son of German immigrants and he was born in Rockland, Maine. This copy negative shows his family's homestead in, in Spetzer, than Germany. I think I pronounced that right. Another card shows World War I era German soldiers, possibly including one of Kassen's family members. This um, view also demonstrates what they did when they broke a glass plate or didn't have one to begin with. They simply took an existing photograph or postcard, tacked it to a wall, I made a copy photograph of it. Here are two family portraits that show Cassins and his wife and children. They're about a decade apart. His son um, went on to join in the family business and oversaw the Florida branch of the operation. So Cassins owned the company until 19, 1947, and then it went on to change ownerships several times. Ultimately, in the early 1980s, it was purchased by Down East, Down East Magazine. And what we see here is the Down East Magazine headquarters, which is in Rockport. Down East had some thoughts of having a vintage postcard line, 
and wanted some of the older images for stock views for the magazine. Um, but the size of the collection and other issues prevented either of those things from ever happening. And they ended up donating the whole archive of glass plate negatives to the main photographic workshops, which is where I first encountered them. They actually sold the business name to an outfit in Union, Maine, that still uses it today and still makes postcards and calendars. So after receiving my professional certificate in photography um, with the workshops, I wanted to stay in that creative bubble and I took a job working on the collection. The ultimate goal, as I learned, was to monetize it as much as possible. Of course, that meant figuring out how to digitize it, figuring out what was in the collection, and what markets might be out there. And I spent the next two years doing that, just that. Um, you can look behind the younger version of me and you see that huge kind of machine that went on another three feet. That was the scanner that I was using back in uh, 2004, the size of a small car. And each scan took more than two minutes to make. It's much different today. Unfortunately, the main photo workshops fell victim to the market crash in 2006, and the school was foreclosed upon. All the employees were laid off, and I didn't know what would happen to the school or to the collection. On Super Bowl Sunday of 2007, I received a dreaded phone call from one of my friends who told me that the pipes had burst in Union Hall, the collection was soaked, and they were going to throw it all away. Fortunately, I had some friends coming over to enjoy the Super Bowl at my house, and I believe I bribed them maybe with beer, I'm not sure, but they came with me down to Rockport, and we spent six hours that night taking all the boxes out from the downstairs of this building and bringing them up to the dining hall. A few phone calls to RIT in the Eastman House, I learned that it was okay for the glass negatives to get wet. They just needed to dry without touching another negative and without being inside the paper envelopes that I had been putting them in in the last two years. <laughs> but I came up with a plan and I bought Home Depot out of all their wire bathroom racks and set up a staging where I could dry them out like plates. They were plates. Um, and that, took, that whole process took over five weeks. I wrapped everything in plastic to keep it wet until I could deal with it. Toward the end, a lot of the boxes were getting covered with mold and it was pretty nasty. Um, but the good part was that very few negatives were totally lost. During that time, the workshops traded hands. The new group, a nonprofit group, um, did not want the collection and didn't see it as part of the school's vision. And so the collection was donated along to the Penobscot Marine Museum um, with the only condition that they take me along with it. So the collection and myself were donated in 2007. <laughs> Here we see the Penobscot Marine Museum when it first opened in 1936. At that time, it was this, only this one building. And uh, now the museum has expanded to be a full campus, um, two city blocks big, with more than 13 buildings, several of which are on the National Historic Register. This is what the collection looks like today. What you're looking at are, is half of the main negatives. And each box holds about 125 negatives and weighs more than 20 pounds. So there's a lot of weight being carried on those shelves. In 2016, I got to work with my two history heroes, Earl Shuttleworth, the main state historian, and um, William H. Bunting to produce a book focusing only on the main portion of the collection called Maine on Glass. The next year, a local documentary filmmaker named Sumner McCain made a full-length documentary about the collection called The Northeast by Eastern, which for the past couple years has aired on PBS over the winters. So by the numbers, 
this shows you how many negatives we have of each state. The, the line for miscellaneous is majority is Florida, but there's also a good number of Bermuda, and then the scattering of towns in Pennsylvania, Maryland, Ohio, that Cassins would travel down to his winter residence in Florida. Now what's even more interesting is when I came to the museum from the workshops, there were only about 35,000 negatives at the time. It didn't take too long for me to figure out that many negatives were missing. And then over time, I've been able to track down where they are, or where a lot of them are, and been able to add, add over 15,000 plates back to the collection. Um, these additions have come from more than 50 different sources. Part of the trick is, or part of the, the challenge is not knowing where the finish line is. <laughs> so we'll close out the show and just look at a couple views from the different places that um, are represented in the collection. And this one of Greensboro, Vermont, um, is part of the reason that I became interested in the first place, because when I walked in and saw more than 10 boxes of Greensboro on the librarian's desk. Um, Greensboro is a little town in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont. Um, I couldn't imagine what would be in these boxes, and when I looked and saw these type of images, uh, I was blown away. Old Mystic, Connecticut. Down in Maryland. Florida, Bermuda, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New York. And the New York plates are primarily the Adirondack region and the surrounds. New Hampshire. Of course, Maine. And because these negatives are five inches by seven inches, there are so many details that are revealed when you're able to zoom in. This is Witta Pitlock, and if you go to Witta Pitlock now, which is up in Aroostook County, nothing is left of this entire scene. But at one point in time, it was a semi-prosperous town. These are zoom-ins from that same image. World War I platoon that was in Maine for some reason. And in the midst of all those soldiers, you can see the Eastern photographer's vehicle. <laughs> and so this is the last image, but it's an especially iconic image. This is the Waldo Hancock Bridge, which spans the Penobscot River. It was opening day um, when this image was taken, and there's a parade of people walking across. Prior to that, you had to take a car ferry um, across if you wanted the other side, but most people actually went by steamboat. But this bridge opened up um, the northern part of Maine and Mount Desert Island to people with cars. Um, it was essentially ushering in the automobile age as the steamboat age um, passed by. So. Thank you very much. I'm glad to take some questions. That was a wonderful talk. Thank you. In the uh, 
<coughs> excuse me, in the come to Maine uh, sort of theme, I hear echoes of old home week. Uh, had you picked up any of that? Is there are there any old home week uh, materials in those collections? I have not seen any old home week in the Eastern collection, but we have other collections where it is prominently on display and bunting everywhere. Thank you. Right, I'm going to just grab the microphone again on the way. In the uh, early sh uh, slide, you told exactly how many postcards were mailed in a given year in the uh, shot of the postcard shop. How do you know how many postcards were mailed in any given year? That was a, a statistic in a woman's book. Um, Rosamond Bayou, I believe is her name. And she was able to access some post office records and she had some amazing statistics in there that I've plagiarized a little bit. <laughs> she has an earlier date too um, and it shows the jump in just two years the number of postcards that were sent. Did that answer your question Beth? Uh, yes. Okay. Hi David. Hi. So uh, just an anecdote for the crowd is that at one point in a pilgrimage up in that neck of the woods, uh, the collection was offered to me and I declined it because uh -oh. I knew what it was getting into. <laughs> Just FYI, it was fun, to fun factoid. But I do have two, uh, two questions. One is, they're both the same, uh, the number of. The number of photographers uh, and the number of, if any, interviews of employees or photographers that exist. Maybe they're in the PBS doc, I don't know. So I've heard estimates that there were seven to eight photographers on staff each season, and each season was counted kind of in and of itself. Um, but the only interviews of at least the early days um, were the ones that were done by Brewster Harding, and he was able to interview several people that worked in the original outfit. The, the last owner of Eastern Illustrating, um, I was able to interview, but he only, he did the, the color views. He was the one that essentially told them that you need to switch to color or um, you're not gonna make it. So does, does, did Brewster publish, did Brewster publish them or? Brewster published a book called Roadside New England and it's, it's definitely image driven, um, but he has maybe three or four pages in the beginning that relate information he got in those interviews. It was not like a, it was not presented in an interview form, but he learned X from this person and X from that person type of thing. Oh, oh. oh and wow. I have several copies of it, so if you, I can gladly get you a copy of that or oh, photocopy that'd be great. those pages. That would be great. Uh, I'm sorry, just one more quick question, and, and that is, this is a confession of ignorance. Uh, among my friends and myself who collect photo postcards, real photo postcards, I've never heard of toning. Mm. We, I think most of us, or at least in my conversations, have assumed it was a question of inadequate fixing or oxidation over time or whatever. That would account for the difference between uh, coolish black and white and the warm black and white of the cards. Well, part of it is an assumption I mean, it was definitely typical for photos in that early era to be toned in sepia to give them the brownish effect. They also could have used a warm tone paper, but you do see cards that obviously don't have that sepia color from that era. So it's been my, it's more of an assumption on my part than a true fact. Tobacco spit may have had an effect. <laughs> that would be a lot of spit, but you're probably right. Since it was summertime when they were d driving around, were they also taking pictures of things like baseball games and picnics and social life or mostly just buildings? And also, did they, did they get expense money for gas and traveling or did they have to rely on selling all the postcards? 
I believe that they had some expenses covered, maybe their traveling, their gas, and their lodging. I also think that they probably um, made photographs of the different places where they stayed as kind of a trade, um, because there are definitely random houses that are photographed and you're not really sure why. Um, they were very opportunistic, so if they were in a place and something was happening, they would take a photograph. If it was a parade or a picnic or a lively lobster pound, they would photograph that and you would see some action. Um, I think it varied greatly on the photographers, where some were very shy and would like to go when the streets were empty and you, know, you would think these towns were deserted, and then other photographers were much more um, open and wanted to engage with people and get them to pose. I think it was very, uh, when, when these photographers showed up in some of these rural places in a car, you know, no one in the town had a car, the kids would follow them around. And certain clowns, you see the same kids in multiple pictures. So, you know, they were very much intrigued by what was happening. That was so much fun. Um, is it possible to find out if one's town is represented in the collection? Yeah, so uh, you can go onto our website, and then one of the options is to search our online database, and you can put a town in. We, some of you may that are in the museum world may be familiar with Past Perfect, which is our what we use for our database. We um, refer to it as Past Imperfect. Um, and we're actually raising money now to have a more of a custom-built um, database that will be more user-friendly. If you, you know, if you go to search for a town called Port Clyde, for say, in Maine, and you don't know to put quotes around Port Clyde, you'll get everything that has port in it, as well as everything that has Clyde in it. So, but yes, you can go on there, or you can email me and say, what do you have of this place? And I'll tell you. You had an e a URL in, uh, at the very last screen, but now we can't see it. Is that where we should be? I'm, I'm sorry? You had a URL, a, a, a web oh, address yes. in your and final. I also have handouts okay. that I'll put next to the book out front that has my name and email and the museum's website on the back. So I encourage you to reach out. And if you find yourself in Midcoast, Maine, do stop in, and you can come visit me in, in the photo archives. I said that if, if any of you find yourself in Midcoast, Maine, please stop by for a visit and come. you can come find me in the photo archives and get a behind-the-scenes tour. What's the town? Searsport. 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 And again, I have some, my business cards and a, a rack card for the photo archives that I brought with me. So all that information is, you don't have to write it down. 